Hello. For some reason, you're just a black square at the moment, Denise. There you are. Now you're muted. There. Hi. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm good. Aww. It's just did you go to um, did you go to that music thing this year? I okay. did. It was mm -hmm. I was trying to rope you into it. I was like the day before, I was like, oh my God, it's tomorrow. And oh. I was trying to text you. I don't know. I text somebody. I don't know if it's the right number or not, but <laughs> I didn't it was, see it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Denise, go to Old Tone. Come on, go <laughs> I I um I roped, it was the, it was like the most miraculous day. I roped both of my teenage daughters into oh. volunteering to come with me. And they were just both like, I don't want to go. And I'm like, we're going, come on, get in the car. <laughs> and they were awesome. They, yeah. it was, we parked car. It was, it was a sunny, sunny day. It was like really, it was like beautiful, not too hot, but just clear skies. And one of my daughters is like super fair skinned and she's out in the parking lot parking cars all day. And I'm like, I think you're gonna be like a lobster later. And she, <laughs> she really was, but she was fine. And they were, they were just, I was really fun. It was just a one day event. Yeah. So I am um, the last time I was there, Nora Jones. No, not Nora Jones. Nora um, Brown. Nora Brown. And I had never, seen her before and I, I fell in love with her music so I'm following her now and I have her she, she had a record out so she's amazing she's amazing and she's like 15. I know <laughs> maybe her. she's 16 now I think she might yeah. be 16 like um yeah the, the youth right her and Greta yeah. Thurmberg yeah. And so that. like I wish I had had that one of your questions on this thing was, you know, what would you tell your younger self? And, you know, kind of wish I had that drive or focus, you know, to go after the things that I was interested in because she could still have a whole other career <laughs> when she's right. 30. Right, isn't it interesting? Like, I know. And it, well, did you know you were interested in textiles? So let me just preface this whole thing. And we're going to get yeah. started in more. I, I always forget to do this part. And people watch the thing and they're like, well, who are these people? Who are they? What are they doing? So my name is Crispina French. And I am a textile recycling artist, activist, entrepreneur. And I think my friend Denise Schmidt falls into that same category. She is someone I met years ago and has it just had this kind of magical path of the most incredibly beautiful it's like quilts with a little crispina mixed in <laughs> you know like quilts to me like i think of quilts and they're all like super kind of anal right like all those little x's and like intersections all have to be perfect and your quilts just really resonate with me denise because i love how they're just a little bit akimbo i mean there's such beautiful finish and like the craftsmanship um is really beautiful and they're also not exactly like rigid yeah. so um we just um started talking a little bit before i just did that big blah 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 piece and um denise was talking about how one of the questions i like to ask people is like what would you have told your younger self and so just if you could pick it up where we just kind of left off there Denise. yeah um well this idea of you know i think i was pretty timid as a kid. So, you know, and a shy about saying what I wanted and, you know, the things that I wanted to do. And I, I started dancing when I was young and I really loved doing that. And I did it all the way through college, but um, there were other things that I was kind of interested in and I was too shy to, or to, you know, not self-confident enough to make them happen and so i guess what i would say to my younger self is like nobody knows what they're doing <laughs> do, go for it and you know the failure if you fail like that's a great way to learn and yes it's not gonna permanently bruise you it's right it's a, it's a step on the way 
Yeah. And it's funny too. Like, how do you identify failure? I think when we were kids, I think we're about the same age. And I think when we were kids, you know, if you didn't make money, if you didn't have a job, if you weren't like, you know, doing like whatever, chasing something, right. Chasing whatever it is, then maybe you weren't successful. And I think that's kind of changed a bit. You know, I feel like the younger generation has a little bit more, like their scope of success is a little wider. And I feel like, you know, your work and your, your textile or your sensibility to that, is that something that you feel like you knew you had as a kid? I think I did. I think I did. Like I always, you know, I was a little bit quirky and I, I would put together outfits that were weird and um, <laughs> awesome, <laughs> you know, and I, I was very, I've always been particular about my environment and things. My, my parents used to say, you better marry somebody rich because like, <laughs> I was always drawn and it wasn't like that I was interested in the most expensive whatever, but I was interested in well-made things and, and in some ways, you know, yeah, like sometimes the simplest thing might end up being the most expensive, like somehow. Anyway. But um, I think too, I mean, I think too that, you know, the simplest thing and maybe the most expensive thing might just be the thing that you cherish for your life, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not more expensive when you just have it once. <laughs> In its right. doors. Well, and that, and this is to me the the most beautiful idea behind uh, repurposing textiles and things. You know, is like I'm so relieved that our culture, in a broader sense, is finally coming to terms with the fact that a disposable society doesn't work in the long term, and you know, people used to mend and wear things out and then do something else with the clothing or the bedding or whatever it was once it wore out. Like you didn't just throw stuff away and we've gotten so used to cheap clothing that, you know, just ends up we in landfills and it's like some of the worst kind of refuse is from that. So unfortunately, you know, I, I, when you said, when you introduced me and you said something about, like, I feel like I straddle both worlds, unfortunately. Like I, part of how I make my living is designing new quilting fabric, you know, and I do that in a licensed relationship and I have for many years, I have a lot of issues with it <laughs> because do we really need more new stuff and um, textiles, you know, it's gotten better over the years, but it's it's not the cl cleanest kind of production. Yeah, I think too though, Denise, I mean, I think, you know, I'd like to circle back around to, sh to talk more about like your work in general, right? Like your fabrics are beautiful. They're, you know, for me, it's like, there's this place of like, complete acceptance of someone producing something that's new and beautiful and quality that at like like um I was listening I listened to a podcast about quilters and there was a woman talking about how you can make really ugly fabric into a really beautiful quilt if you are able to kind of pair it in ways that make it beautiful and I think that when you have some piece of fabric that has like more maybe a little bit more integrity maybe a little bit better like whatever it is whatever draws you to that and I've worked with a little bit of your fabrics over the years and mm -hmm. I feel like that's what they carry with them they carry with them the ability to draw in these other pieces that might not be what right. you would be able to like without that kind of glue if you will that kind of mm -hmm. aesthetic like connection you just have an ugly quilt <laughs> you know <laughs> It's, well, I think, it's you know, and I, I like to make, when I make my collections, and thank you for that word, and I do feel like I bring a lot of integrity to it, and maybe to my own detriment, like I'm, I'm really careful about the assortment, I like a collection to have a variety of 
density of texture and scale and color. And, you know, if somebody wants to just use all the fabrics in that collection, you know, it'll still work out great in one quilt, but I'm also interested in like the weird juxtapositions of things. And, and even when I'm putting, this is Elliot, even when I'm putting um, the collection together, to me, it's all about juxtaposing, you know, like they're there. And I use um, vintage document fabrics and they're all from different eras. And I play with the scale or, you know, how it's colored and stuff. And, um, and I think that's one of the things about quilting that I love is this idea of, and I think that's what I bring to the quilts that I make too, is this juxtaposition of tradition. Like I like it to have a sense of history, but it's not like, like what went from when, you know, it's yeah. not really. Yeah, it's hard to identify. That's so true yeah. about your work. Um, but it's evocative of, our history of yes. um, another time, maybe, but it also feels modern. Like I love mixing that, those things up. In Yeah, in yeah, yeah, that so speaks to me because it's sort of like, I think maybe that's kind of the, the glue that kind of ties our work together, right? Like we yes. both have this kind of, you know, there's something I love about the actual blanket quilt, like the layer, right? Like the, the warmth that creates and the 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 texture of it and you know the you work in a different it's well it's a different medium I guess it's the same but the different fabrics like you generally work in cottons and with right. layers and where my stuff is more like single layer usually although I've been working with two layers lately um, mm. you know it has the same kind of like uh, just presence right? Like there's like this, there's this level of like history and connection and warmth and tangibility that all kind of play a role in, in the finish of what we both create. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your path because I think that um, I, I don't, I don't really know like the, like how you got started with the whole idea of quilting, how, like what, I, I read a little bit about your history over the years, but if you could share a little bit with our membership, I think they'd be really interested. Um, so it's, it is a kind of circuitous path that brought me to making quilts, but um, I grew up in central Massachusetts, so not far from you, outside of Worcester. Uh -huh. And as you know, our, you know, New England is, um, full of these small towns that had a mill of some kind or a factory, like there are mill towns everywhere. And the whole landscape is built around that almost, you know, there's a stream or a river in a town and the housing, either triple decker or the side-by-side -side worker housing, the red brick factory buildings. So around Worcester, there were a lot of old textile mills and my mother, had a full-time job, but she sewed clothes for us four kids and for herself. My parents were grew up in the depression and they were very frugal. And so we would go to these mill stores, you know, back before they were in a strip mall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, but they were in that those creaky old buildings, and there'd be these you know winding paths through stacks of rolls of fabric on shelves. And it was dusty, and um, and I loved being there. Like I still have such strong memories of the smells and the sounds and the light slanting through and catching the dust. So that was, you know, very much a part of my landscape growing up. Um, and then, you know, I, I I did a bunch of things. The first time I went to college, I I focused on the performing arts. And, um, and then later I had a series of sewing jobs. So I, I worked at the Boston Ballet for a season and um, I worked at a monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts making ecclesiastical vesture and I worked for a clothing designer. So, you know, it was interesting to have a year or two of professional 
you know, sewing experience and working with women that had worked in the Burlington Coat Factory and stuff like that it was pretty fascinating. And That's then so cool to have all that like wealth of knowledge and history, right? Yeah, it was an eclectic, you know, yeah. and I think this has always defined me like this like broad range of experience. And then I went to art school and I, I chose to study graphic design. Um, and this is another, you know, like I tend to make decisions with little knowledge sometimes. Like I, I didn't really know that much about graphic design, but I knew I liked magazines and things like that. And really I just wanted a design education and it seemed like graphic design was something I could apply to anything. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to school? I went to RISD, Rhode Island School. Oh, cool. And that served me well. And I was older by the, you know, I was almost 30 when I went back to school. And um, so I got a lot out of it. And, yeah. and you also, you know, at a school like that, you make a lot of connections and it was a really good time. It was when the computer was just coming out and, you know, we had these little tiny Macs in the design studio. <laughs> so I was able to get you know, jobs when I get out because a lot of the existing design firms were trying to transition to digital and needed people who knew how to do that. So, um, so that's sort of the educational part of it. And then after I graduated, I, I had met this guy at a Cajun dance <laughs> who lived in Connecticut and he was, I knew that he was a traditional boat builder and that was all I knew. And then he lived in Connecticut and his first name was Chris. And this is before the internet. So I started calling boat places in Connecticut and I eventually found him. I moved to Connecticut and we lived together. It, it wasn't a good relationship, but he was also a fiddle player. He played Appalachian string band music and I fell in love with that. So the setting for starting the business was I was isolated, I was far from my friends and family. Yep. I was alone. Um, it was before the internet. Um, I had fallen in love with this music, which, and the dance forms that go along with it, which I see so many correlations between quilting and the music, very simple, repetitive structures, elements repeated over and over, maybe with slight variations each time um anyone can do it uh, so cool to me so cool because like yeah. we circled around each other at shows and for years and connected like here and there and then the last time we saw each other in person we were at the old tone music festival yeah which... so that was me like trying to get back in touch with that aspect i went to west virginia and learned to play the fiddle like i really fell in love with it and then and part of it is a romantic notion. It's not necessarily reality. Like when you start digging around, researching those musicians and the dances and stuff, you find a lot of images from the Works Progress Administration and the 20s when they were documenting rural life in these pockets of the South and the West. And it was, you know, I loved the photographs, women in feed sack dresses and yeah. people square dancing or sitting around a quilt. And what I was missing in my life was that feeling, you know, I, I, want, I wanted this romantic idea of community, yep. of people helping each other out. So I think all those things combined in my head, <laughs> like my loneliness and isolation, this, rose-colored view of how the world once was and maybe was in reality and it's tied to quilting barn raisings you know like all that sort of thing and the music and the dance and then at the same time we had martha stewart who was reinventing women's magazines like yep. you know for, you know deck century we had had domestic content presented in women's magazines, how to clean, how to cook, how to mend, how to sew, but it was presented in a very particular way. And then Martha comes along and starts elevating how we perceive it. And I think that had a huge impact on so many things now. So yes. she made this beautiful magazine. I knew a lot of people who worked there because 
she hired tons of people from RISD. And I, I remember, you know, those that center spread would be their, um, they had a name for it where they would talk about spices or dahlias and they would have a grid yep. of flowers, like always repeated this feature and it would be different objects, but it was the same idea of theme and variation. Like yep. we have, and I have always been drawn to that, like, Here's 12 flower heads, but each one, they're the same, but different. And there's something so endlessly fascinating about that to me, that theme and variation. And I, I think, you know, it's like somehow I landed on quilts where that's an inherent part of it. You know, there's a block design and it's beautiful to just repeat that over and over, but but also to have those subtle variations in each, each piece because it makes us see each one of them differently, but you also perceive it all together. You know, we look our eyes, we look for this sort of order, but we're delighted by the variations that happen. So all those things, like that's the melting pot that somehow <laughs> brought us here today. <laughs> yeah, and like, and back then it was such a weird choice, you know, to say, I'm going to make quilts. I fell in love with quilts that, you know, like you were describing before where there, you know, it's not, it's not about the perfection. A lot of what we know of quilts um, are these quilts that were, were made mainly by wealthy ladies and they survived because they were hardly ever used. Right. So part of our knowledge of quilting are, are these very sort of high end in a way, mm -hmm. perfect, beautiful quilts. On the other side of it are quilts that people used every day. And we don't have as mu a much of a record of those because they were used every day and yeah. they did not survive. Yeah. Um, but some of them have, <laughs> and those were the ones, you know, sort of utilitarian everyday quilts where things don't line up um there's you know maybe they ran out of fabric like it's all the same fabrics and then in one corner it's just like weirdo oddball thing like, that's so I weird just love that the but most, I love right? it. <laughs> it's that juxtaposition yeah and I just you know I it still surprises me that I'm so interested in it like I get bored easily with a lot of other things but I still see so many possibilities for yeah I think that's that's um that's like because you found your your like your spot right like I don't know it sounds a little weird but like it's like your sacred duty was to like funnel <laughs> all of that like interesting kind of simplicity with the community with the you know repeated kind of um pieces and segments that repeat to where you are so it's mm -hmm. like that is what you're here for you know <laughs> and i think that also i think um when you got done with your RISD experience and were you um were you did you do anything design work or anything with martha stewart were you featured there and how did you kind of get on the map yeah i mean that that was probably you know early on i did a couple of small things um but then she did a story about me my business in 98 so that was early on. I started, I launched the business in 96. So she did these working features where she would profile usually a woman owned business. And, um, you know, people, I still hear from people who, you know, like, oh, I tore that out and I put it in my files. Like, I remember <laughs> that. So that, that you know, Everybody thinks like, oh, you're featured in a magazine, especially back then when it was only the only way to get broad, to have yourself seen broadly right. before the internet. Um, you know, that, that's gonna change your life overnight. And of course it doesn't, you know this, you've been, yes. it helps, it's a yeah. stepping stone, yes. but it's, it's never like, and you still have to do all the hard work, you know, to, to make it yeah, yeah totally I, I remember feeling like you know people you know, when you are like when you 
gain that kind of exposure. And I think it still happens today, even with the internet. It, you know, if you get like some big splash somewhere, people automatically assume that like you're a millionaire now <laughs> and you know, your life is complete, you know, now you're gonna, right. yeah, what, they just imagine that, I I guess I imagine that they imagine. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure if that's what people imagine. Well, but I think unfortunately, though. because we do the same thing, you know, we read about somebody and a lot of the details are left out, you know, like all sure. the sweat and agony and self doubt. And, you know, those months where you can't hardly pay the bills. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, and that's just the nature of press and that kind of exposure where, you know, they want to tell a good story and, and you, you can't, you can't cover all of it. So for better or worse, um, you know, and I think especially that article, like oddly enough, so I started out making own finished quilts mm -hmm. and showing them at, at, at a trade show. And, um, and then eventually, you know, I got sucked into the, um, the DIY end of things, the quilting industry, which, you know, I'm still part of designing fabrics and patterns and doing books and stuff. Um, and there, there's been a movement the last 10 or 12 years, you know, called the modern quilt movement. And I've never been a joiner. I never belonged to a guild. I'm just, it's not my nature. I'm kind of an introvert and, um, but this whole movement sprang up and they cite me as one, you know, like one of the main inspirations. And it was that article really. So like here you have mm -hmm. at that time, it was young women, like, and, and that was one of my goals was to sort of change people's perceptions about quilting. You know, mm -hmm. it's- You it did. And you I did. did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> yeah. No, for better. I mean, honestly, like, I kind of feel like you're, you know, people say this to me about my work too. And it's sometimes like, I, I, I don't think about it and I don't like, it doesn't kind of go all the way in, but like your aesthetic and your quality and your finish and like all of it, like all of those pieces together have really impacted quilting in general. And I mean, there's a lot of people now who make quilts that are not anal retentive squares with little corners yeah. that match and yeah. you know and there's it, a lot and it wasn't just me alone but no like, but no an influence um, certainly yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and also I think the other thing that I found um interesting about you is that you started with the quilts you were making your quilts and then you kind of transitioned into a place where you know you license your designs you des design fabric you do the DIY thing so it's not like I kind of feel like there's a lot of people in Stitcherhood who are entrepreneurial, either starting a business or thinking about ways in which they can grow the business that they love and better serve them. And I feel like the ability to kind of like always be kind of moving forward with, you know, you know, whatever you need to bring into your life, maybe that was a way to, you know, help other people design nice quilts and also, you know, pay your bills in a different kind of way. Um, so that that's you know what um are you working on fabric design today is that some still a piece of what you do and what do you like best about your current um creative process <laughs> <laughs> um what do i like best i you know i think i, I think of myself primarily as a designer yeah you know, it's interesting but i you know i love being a craft person as well and i yeah um, if I could make my living just from making, I would because, yeah. but it's quilts are slow and mm -hmm. it's just not realistic. Um, so, you know, doing all the other stuff, it can get hard. It can be really a challenge. And I've, I've been struggling with that all, on and off a lot lately over the last few years to sort of balance it all. Um, but I, I love designing the best um, and whether it's fabric, you know, I, like each, each of those projects has different um, appeal, like putting a fabric collection together. Like I have to kind of work on it all at once. I can't like work a little and then do something else. It's really like an all in kind of thing for me. And then 
and then I start, you know, like the, I have a new collection. So I just started licensing again. I had stopped for a couple of years. And so now I'm working with Wyndham Fabrics and they, they produce my uh, fabrics that are available for quilt shops. And um, I get kind of excited to, you know, about the marketing part. And I, it's, it's tricky because they don't really have a budget. So I have to like really rein myself in, but this new collection, like I really want to photograph it in an old house with wall floral wallpaper that's peeling, <laughs> you know, and with a lot of beds. So I get excited about those things. And that's what leads me down like so many different paths of, of um, exploration and, and it, and it all, you know, a lot of that to me comes back to New England. Like to me, it's really about like, where I grew up, this layering of things. I really get excited about that. Um, but then I also love, I did a residency this summer at Haystack and um, that was so good for me to have time to just focus on, you know, with no deadlines, no commerce aspect yep. of it. And I was really relieved and <laughs> excited to discover that I still have ideas. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> and, awesome. And it's I so feel interesting. Excited about stuff. Yeah. So I, I hope that I can figure out ways to carve out time to work on some of those ideas. And it's a challenge because they aren't necessarily immediately income producing, you know. Um, and Isn't it so like it's such a different mindset for me. Like, and I think we share that because we both have kind of created our lives around a business that we're about a thing that we're passionate about doing like making right and like whenever and even when I'm talking to people who are, are like at a workshop if I'm teaching a workshop and I'm talking to somebody I always think how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost when it's done <laughs> uh, that's like the it's like in there and it's like for me to like break outside of that and be able to just like make for pure joy and like turn materials that I love into something that I'm going to wear. Like I very, I, I almost, I don't think actually I've ever made anything that was specifically for me. But that's, that's okay too. You know, it doesn't have to, like, I think it's interesting that as entrepreneurial women, like, you know, to me, I guess that's how I define designer, like as yes. the sort of top most part of what I do, because designing mm -hmm. is, it isn't necessarily always about you being the maker, right? right? You know, like in a hands-on way, it's, um, you know, how can I, like I can envision the thing and how can I make it available in a way that makes sense? Like, how can I put it out into the world in a way that makes sense either economically or yeah. time-wise or whatever? Yeah. Like, I think that is an interesting skill, you know, and it's, it's a, yeah. it's a different mindset, but it's, and it's sort of to me related to the craftsperson of old, you know, who was a maker, who like the yeah. cabinet maker, yeah. the carpet maker, the spinner, the weaver. I mean, they, they made their livings from the right. things that they yeah. did. They weren't just making things for themselves. They were just, you know, and then, you know, when sometimes the cabinet made, maker needed a cabinet and they would make one, but you know, yeah, it's very interesting. And I, I, I love it, but it's also something that sometimes I ca catch myself like thinking like, how would it be if that wasn't there? How would it be, you know, to have a residency and have time to just like play and not have to like, <laughs> you know, imagine like, a schedule or a deadline or a cost a limit or whatever it's like it's kind of like this magical place I can imagine how long were you there two weeks oh two weeks. it could have been longer but you know plenty of time that, probably, that right? felt like a gift and it was yeah. it did exactly what I had hoped it would do just sort of shut down all the worry and the stress that I had been immersed in for so long and yeah. allowed me to step outside of that and kind of yeah. reconnect, reconnect with what I love about what I do. Yeah. Um, 
And I do think, you know, it's probably a balance. Like I would love it if I could do something like that. You know, all right, sometimes I don't know how to manifest it, but I have, you know, the sort of vague idea and the distance is some kind of schedule where, you know, like I could go someplace, you know, a, sh a shack in Maine and spend three months making new work that I then sell the rest of the year. So it's less about, you know, and then the rest of the year can be all the marketing and the licensing and the whatever, but to build a body of work in a period of time with, with that idea of freedom, you know, it's, it's not a commission, it's whatever I feel like doing. Yep. And concentrated, you know, without all the other distractions. And then, and there are some models for that, like, um, I don't know if you know Tyler Hayes, BDDW. Mm -mm. He's a furniture maker. Um, he, he's, he has a shop in New York on Crosby Street, and I've always loved his work. And he's, I think you would appreciate his aesthetic. Wow, sounds he's good. Very much in tune with an incredible craftsmanship. But they, they moved their production to Philly. Okay. And somewhere where the, the buildings are, he found a clay pit and he started experimenting with clay and he does these amazing, so like they'll have these auctions online and um, they'll just have a batch like every six months or whatever and you buy whatever is there. Yep. So it's less about making things to order, Yeah. but just making a bunch of work and then selling it. Yeah, I, I like think that, that model's a really good model. And I, I think that also when you build a body of work, it's sort of like, it's more important as a um, collection. I mean, maybe that important not the right word, but the, I've been doing that. I've, I've been doing where like, it's not as like, like not as long of a period, but I'll like, like once a month this time of year once a month I do what I'm calling a shop drop where I can like make stuff for three or four weeks and then okay now it's all together and it looks nice as a group and people come and they it's not like what you know if I posted things like individually as they came about it would have less kind of of a story to tell it's more right. like I don't know I feel like that's a really I think it, it's really well received by people too to kind of like oh, this is what Denise did for, I mean, I love the idea of doing it in like a chunk of time to like, you know, three months. To, oh my God, heaven on earth, girl. I know. I'll put a mini, I'll put a little tiny house on my back, on the back okay. floor. <laughs> you can come out here, bring your treadle sewing machine. Yeah. The internet service kind of sucks, but it's actually <laughs> way better than it was. Um, but I love that idea. And so I was wondering, like, we talked a little bit and as we were kind of putting together our, this interview about just kind of like moving forward in a kind of unknown territory and having like, do you have ideas? Like if you could project like two years out from now, like what would be your dream come true? Well, something that, yeah, I mean, so part of the, the vision is um, this idea of a moving you know I'm a little afraid of it because I'm I turned 60 this year and oh my um, god you look so young Denise oh I, my god but I'm 60 <laughs> and I'm you know I do everything myself I live alone yeah. I work yeah. alone and it's hard so to the idea of and like, there's a flipping pandemic and there's been a tip pandemic but <laughs> I have I can't I can't sort of let go of this vision and and even this idea of you know like having a place to photograph quilts on beds my house is very small yeah and I don't you know the idea of going through like renting a place and you know I just want to have my place that that reflects my aesthetic mm -hmm. and that has plenty of places where I can do those kind of photographs because they are they have become so important right for showing what you do and communicating that so it's just been you know, given everything else that I do, it's been really hard to kind of figure out where is that, you know, one, my sister still lives in Massachusetts. So sometimes I think Western Massachusetts or Southern Vermont, but I get drawn to the coast and I still live, I live on the coast in Bridgeport. Um, 
I love being near the water. So Maine is the other, and it's gotta be cheap. <laughs> my, yeah. And the other motivating factor for that is my taxes are really high here. And yeah. so, you know, thinking about lowering my overhead nugget, like not having a separate studio that I pay rent on, mm -hmm. kind of bringing that back in and having a garage or a barn mm -hmm. and a place where I can bring people together more easily. Yes. Yes. Because you know, part of how I make my living is teaching. Yeah. But maybe it's more about hosting residencies for people like you. <laughs> that's like such a nice idea. I love that yeah. idea. So yeah. that's kind of and and as a way of thinking about, you know, I could also if it's a place where I could host other teachers, um, it's a plan toward retirement you know like mm -hmm. or slowing down somehow mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's what's swirling around in my head but you know also you know some of the work that i did at haystack i really want to do one thing i experimented with was screen printing you know i've been doing these big organic you know mysterious shape motifs in applique and i love doing it as applique but it's slow mm -hmm. so I did a little screen printing at Haystack and that was very exciting. And I'd love to spend a few months just doing that. Do you know um, that um, I screen print? No. My, um, so my- oh, you do your- Can you see that calendar back there? Oh yeah. My, um, that's a Dolphin Studio calendar. And my, my mom and dad founded the screen printing business called the Dolphin Studio in 1970. And oh my so, God. Yeah, my sister and I and run it together and we share a studio space. So like my textile studio is upstairs and the print shop is downstairs. Oh. And, um, you know, right now we're super busy with <laughs> calendars as a seasonal business, which is That's nice because so it kind of like you can kind of one of the things I've learned or I'm learning and that is maybe maybe important, maybe not so much, but um, just the, the schedule, right? Like the idea of like your idea of like doing a three month, like kind of just making time of the year and then having the rest of the year focused on different aspects of what you're, what's involved in running a business, which I think a lot of people aren't really aware of. Like people think that we like spend all our days making things. I remember when my business, you know, at trade shows was Crispina Designs and people would, and the, same for you. I'm sure everybody thinks that like you cut every single piece of fabric and you make every stitch on all your quilts and it's like no that actually takes a staff of 40 like for me it did and it's just yeah. like people don't understand how much is actually involved and you know it's i think that's pretty accurate for me too like a probably 25 percent of my time is actually making and right. you know the rest and of managing and all that other stuff is and, and being be inspired fun. and traveling and seeing other artists and like doing i mean it's fun but it's 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 part of your job that you, you know, to, to keep inspired and, you know, going to Haystack for two weeks is, is lovely. And it's, it's probably really nurturing, but it's also part of what you need to yeah. be a successful um, business person in your line of work. So um, yeah. all of those things are um, pieces of, you know, the puzzle that are kind of like, you know, one of the things that I, I, I think a lot about, and I'm really focused on now is like, understanding how much you know we as artists love I mean I don't want to speak for you but it seems as though we love our jobs and it's like I don't mind staying up till midnight making something because I love it I love to do what I do but those hours are hours that we need to be compensated for in our source you know through our income streams so you know if that means licensing designs to the fabric companies that manufacture or you know, selling, uh, you know, doing consulting work with large volume textile waste generators or whatever that means. That's, that's part of what we build as our business to support our lifestyles. And um, I feel like that's something that we still have uh, the ability to focus more energy on. Cause I think it's uh, even with the experience that I carry with me, it's still challenging. It's just a challenge to to say, We're yeah, all you need right. to make this much money for that blanket, it's going to cost you 1500 bucks. Like, and it's, it's relentless, you know, like it's, yeah. it's, and it's a challenge to wear all the hats. And as I get older, I think, you know, I'm finding that I don't multitask as well as I used to. <laughs> yeah. So, and you don't have to wear all the hats. 
Yeah. You really don't, you know, yeah. like I, there, there, there's a, I've learned over the last couple of years that there's all sorts of places you can find help that are, you know, any kind of online stuff can be done by smart people who live anywhere. They don't even need to be in your vicinity. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of nice to be able to fall back on. So you're not feeling, you're not struggling or doing, I mean, I, I personally, I'm, I really struggle with attention. Like if I go on social media, I, I, I just can't, I just, it's my day is gone. Yeah. So I have this lovely helper who lives in Las Vegas, Nevada, who does my social media things for oh. me. And, you know, I'll give them the pictures and I'll influence the captions and they just disseminate oh, it. For me because, yeah. And it's like, it then gives, it gives me so much time way more time than it takes that it's person to do really, it. It does get you, you do get sucked in. You know, I try to go on and just do a post and then before I know it. I'm like looking at the grandbabies of somebody I went to the prom with and I'm like, who cares? Like, I don't, I really don't care. Right. We wouldn't, I mean, I know. You know. social media is interesting. It's, I mean, it's, it's so much of how, what drives business right now, yes. but it's also, it's someone else's business yes. and they're making money. From right. that. So I'm really focusing on like, you know, my newsletter to my mailing list is more important. Mailing list, man, it's the most important thing you can do as far yeah. as a business goes. And I also think that um, being like this platform, the, this the interview will be shared in Stitcherhood, which is a membership program, a membership um, community that I built in a platform that's called Mighty Networks. And I love Mighty Networks. It's women run. It, there's no algorithm. There's no advertising. It's what it's everything that Facebook is that's awesome and none of the bullshit. And I just, um, you know, love it for that reason, because there's there's a lot to be said. And like you were saying about being alone and working alone and being in a pandemic alone, like that is an like you know, I get I get crazy with my teenagers. I'm like, oh, my God, 14, 15 year old girls. I'm like, Ooh. but then I think, <laughs> holy shit, like, you know, they keep me from being bored or lonely. I mean, honestly, like, I mean, and I love them and they're awesome, but there are days where I just would like, oh my gosh, I'd like a one day or an hour where I'm just like, nobody needs me. I'm not like on call for any reason. Yeah. And then I think about people who are always in that way. And it's, it's something that just is not, it's, it's, it's sort of, I, I think it's sort of uh the antithesis of our human nature like we're we're connect we're compassionate empathetic beings that need each other and need that community and especially in our work where it's all about the people right like it's all it's a it's a it's not a spectator sport it's like something that people do together and so um i feel like having the connection that we are able to garner with our with this kind of technology and building communities online and having them be a safe space and not manipulated by whatever algorithm i don't even know what an algorithm actually else is. is bottom line you know someone else's bottom line right. like oh no, yeah um, how did it how dare you yeah yeah, yeah exactly um, so well denise i am really excited to have this had this opportunity to kind of catch up a little bit i um i'm looking forward we're going to be hosting you on the 17th in our collaborators group which is going to be so nice um and we'll have like a live q a there with you and talk a little bit more about you know just like your path and your business and what you um what you we kind of touched upon today so um I'm looking forward to that and I am so glad to connect with you so thank you so much for your time today nice to have this chance to talk so thanks for inviting me in yeah I think we should really um we're not far apart I think we should um go for a hike I would love person. that I don't know okay. if you remember when I I came up to see you once I remember yeah I was, was so awesome. yeah it was lovely kind of figure things out and I'm like yeah. Chris knows what she's doing <laughs> Um, but let's make that happen. I would really okay, let's do it. That'd be so fun. Um, I'll be in touch with you um, after this and we'll make it work out. Sounds good. Have a really great day, darling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Oh.